Ja, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Allow me to welcome you, uh, despite the fact that it's unbelievably beautiful outside. Many of you have come this afternoon to participate in these discussions. The title of today's discussion is, Is the Right of Food an Illusion? I've uh, thought a little bit about this title. Uh, it implies that there's a human right not to starve. But this is a right which is obviously not effective because many, many people die of hunger despite this right existing. So who or what is to blame? We have a number of participants today. Philip Erne, who's an expert for agriculture and uh, gene technology at uh, the School of Zurich. He is a co-founder of the African Technology Development Forum. And he stepped in at the last minute for the general director of the World Bank. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Ernie, for having made yourself available at such short notice. Olivier de Schutter, who is sitting alongside him, is the UN Special Envoy for the Right to Food from Belgium. Welcome, Mr. de Schutter. Peter Stauder is CEO of Tongat Hulut Limited in South Africa. He, it's part of his work. It's uh, a firm which is responsible for producing biofuels. And finally, Rudolf Wrechsteiner, who's a national councillor of the SDP and a president of uh, Swiss Aid in Basel. I'll be talking to the panelists on the stage for about an hour, and then we'll open up for your questions. Perhaps um, you've seen the questions that we'll be discussing. In the program, I'd like to know how serious the crisis is, what reasons uh, there are for the crisis. Some of them have been mentioned in our program. We'll look into those. And what measures are necessary? Not really to leave the crisis completely, but simply to improve the situation somewhat, at the very least. Olivier de Schutter from the UN, responsible for the right to food. I'd like to ask you just how serious is uh, the food crisis? Okay, thank you. I would like to thank you for this opportunity to discuss this very important subject. Um, we have very recently reached the one billion people hungry. These people were 923 million at the beginning of this year, 2008, actually, one year ago. There were 852 million in 2005 the fight against hunger is a fight we're losing. Every year, 5,400,000 children under age of five die from the direct or indirect causes of hunger and malnutrition. Um, the prices, it is true, have gone down on the international markets in comparison to a peak they had reached in June 2008. But this is not a solution. It's not a solution, first of all, because they remain relatively high in comparison to earlier years. They are increasingly volatile, and all predictions are that they shall remain at high levels and volatile in the next few years. And it's not a, it's not a solution, especially because out of this one billion people who are hungry, the majority are food producers, small farmers, who live from farming on small plots of land, two hectares of land or less, and are unable to live from their farming in many ways because the prices are too low and because they don't have access to markets at which they could sell at better prices. Lassen Sie mich einhaken. Uh Just allow me to step in there. We have already touched upon a very important point, expensive food um, as a result of speculation. We'll come to that and discuss it. But allow me to um, ask a particular question. You say that there are almost a billion people who are starving. Uh, has that got worse over the last 10 years? 
Uh, there are Millennium Development Goals, for example. Have, despite those goals, has the situation got worse? The situation has worsened. Um, the Millennium Development Goals are um, one way to keep track of what is happening, and the news is very disappointing. We are actually not succeeding in alleviating hunger. And I'd like to emphasize here that the problem is twofold. There are two parts of the equation. And one part is producing more food for the world. Because of climate change, because of increasing demand, growth in population, shifting diets, we need to produce more food. We need, it is estimated, to double the production of food by 2050 and increase it by 50% by 2030. That's one part of the equation. And much of the effort of the international community today is to improve production, improve productivity, boost agricultural production. But the other part of the equation is to ensure that those who are hungry gain access to food, that food is accessible for them. It's useless to double the amount of food produced, the amount of food available, if you have many millions of people who don't have the purchasing power they require to buy the food which is available on the markets. Das wäre dann, wenn ich so if I understand you correctly, that would be a second reason uh, added to the one that you've already outlined. It's not only speculation uh, in commodities and the high prices, but also access to food. So we have two reasons there for the worsening situation, um, in, in addition to the fact that there is a greater demand for food. Turning to our three other panelists, what are the main reasons in your view for the worsening situation, Mr. Stada? First of all, it is very important to recognize that long before this price hike in food, there's been a problem um, uh, in the world. And the, and the problem is much greater than just people dying, um, uh, particularly when you look at young people and when you've got malnutrition and you see stunted growth and you see the problems with learnings, then you know how big the problem is. Um, uh, when you look at this problem worldwide, um, uh, I think it's important to make the distinction that it applies to certain geographic regions in the world. It's not something that you talk about Europe. So if you look, for example, the countries where we operate in sub-Saharan Africa, it's typically estimated that 28% of the children have got a malnutrition problem, by the way, which is enormous in itself. If one then looked at the spike hike, where we talked about the world growing, more food, people eating more meat, etc., I believe it often misunderstands the core underlying issue that was there actually before the spike hike, and even where the food prices are coming down today is still there, and that is what happens in places like Mozambique. When you talk about places like Mozambique, to think that you've got a functional food market, you're living in cuckoo land, by the way, at I the start. same time. Hmm? I don't know what is cuckoo land in the German translation, but you are dreaming. When dreaming. You think about it's an illusion. They are, it's an illusion to think there are functional food markets in a country like that. The world has put little effort, in my opinion, a little investment to recognize that as it needs more food, there's actually an opportunity here. If you look at the arable land in the world that's available for agricultural development, much of that arable land, ironically enough, is in countries, for example, like Mozambique. So you have quite a sort of contradiction here nearly. On the one side, you've got people that are poor, that have got no functional food market, that are battling sometimes with malnutrition. At the same time, you have a country which potentially could be one of the solutions to the world food situation in the years forward. To break out of that cycle, though, has not been possible before the food spike, during the food spike, and even today, one battles to get out of it. So to summarize okay. in my mind, you know, we, we over-talk about the reason why the food prices went up. We ignore some of the dynamics of the world where there are specific areas of the world where the malnutrition is common. And what are really the problems in those parts of the world? So you would say that the problems run a, deeper, run a lot deeper and uh, relate to fundamental 
negligence of development in countries. Rudolf Eichstein, in your view, what are the main reasons uh, that uh, need to be identified and discussed? Well, people who are going hungry today, um, when we've seen food riots throughout the world because food is no longer affordable for many people. It sounds quite trivial, but the fact is that corn prices over the last five years have tripled. In part, this is to do with the agricultural policy of the North. The EU and the USA have decided to use may use corn and other cereals for fuels. That's one of the reasons uh, oil is a lot more expensive or was a lot more expensive. Uh, fertilizer therefore increases in price as a result of the price oil hike. So there are many factors which have led to this and they still exist even though in the perhaps to a lesser degree. Well it might be that um, at the moment, the media is exaggerating the situation. Well, there are a number of countries such as Philippines, Senegal, who have 50 to 70 percent imports of food, so they are directly affected by the rise in food prices. Mozambique and other countries in South Africa have a reserves of land in Zimbabwe. Uh, the situation is difficult. For a very long time, there's been no investment in agriculture, and the North has done something very bad. All of the surpluses in the North were subsidized, and so the prices on the world market were subsidized. That's been the case for a long time. And there, there wasn't direct income subsidy. And secondly, the Swiss agricultural policy, for example, has uh, prohibited export to uh, it prevented imports from countries with surpluses in the south and therefore not allowed revenues for those countries. I've been pursuing an initiative for a ban on ban on on biofuels from agricultural crops i don't believe that it will ever bring significant revenues it's a policy which enables the americans to drive large cars without changing their lifestyle maybe that's the only thing that was behind it and it doesn't add an add to our energy sources mr chatev um using food to drive cars, is that not uh, perverse? Very important to make a few very key distinctions. And, uh, I think the first one, if, if you look at like at the United States farming sector and they start to convert corn or maize as we call it to biofuels, then I agree with the previous speaker entirely by the way. It's, uh, that's a certain paradigm, that's a certain situation. When you in the European Union convert some of the previous food production into biofuels, I agree with the previous speaker. The dilemma when you only look at that, by the way, um, the Americans converting the maize or the corn, the Europeans converting some of the previous food production, it does ignore that there are places in the world where you can grow, for example, sugarcane, where you can grow yasropa, where those countries are desperately in need in some economic development, by the way, where there is arable land, where there is water, where there is the opportunity to establish, as we say in German, some Wirtschaft for the country, to get some earnings going in the country. And it's very sad that people always mix up the whole question of food, food prices, corn, wheat, and they ignore those particular areas I mean, it, itself. If you take and I can number a number of countries like that where the opportunity exists without debushing, without deforestating to create some industry. And I believe that's the space in the sun for some biofuels. I don't believe biofuels are the answer to the world's energy problem. There's no predictions that it will ever be more than 10% of the fuel component or the energy component of the world. But it has got some niche opportunities, by the way, how to move forward. And it's a pity.
when we ignore those niche opportunities. A place like Mozambique as an example of Zimbabwe in the years to come, and we're big investors in Zimbabwe and working very hard to try and get it to a better place in the sun. Those countries have got water. They've got poor people who want to work. You have the opportunity in those countries to grow products like sugarcane, and from sugarcane you can make biofuels. Herr Ernie, erlauben Sie, dass ich hier noch... Allow me just to remain with these two gentlemen before we include you in our discussions. Uh, the point is that according to common sense and uh, in light of the discussions of the past few months, there is a consensus that uh, food which is necessary to feed people should not be used for biofuels. It's not done in Switzerland and I think that the EU has reached a similar point. Are the Americans not also, Mr. Bergsteiner, uh, on the way to the same conclusion, or is it a big debate? Well, many uh, biofuel companies have gone bankrupt because of the oil prices collapsed so suddenly, and uh, the hype bubble has burst. But I do think that there is still a potential problem, especially uh, for non-food products, what's happening in Brazil at the moment. And I'm not trying to say uh, that uh, there aren't good examples, which you've mentioned, but what has happened in Brazil, for example, is that uh, grasslands are being planted with soya, palm oil, sugar cane, and the farmers are being pushed out into the rainforests Rainforests are being deforested um, in the name sometimes of stopping climate change. And, and it takes 73 years for the rainforest to grow again after being destroyed for growing palm uh, crops. So this approach of saying there's ethanol and then you can buy that on the international market and there are good controls. Um, these controls simply don't exist on the international market. So apart from a couple of good examples, there are very bad examples. Uh, water, water reserves are disappearing for the native population. Uh, farmers are being pushed off their lands in Guatemala, in Colombia. Rainforests are being dis destroyed. and. The, the situation is such that um, we're seeing an incredibly destructive result. So before going any further, I think it's necessary to declare a moratorium and more clearly define the criteria, one of which is that anybody wanting to export biofuels should protect the woods to the same level of quality as they're protected in Switzerland. And the other question is, is there really unused arable land? Yes, there is, but that's not actually being used. What's happened is that there's deforestation, and quite often the, the land um, overall is too expensive. Thank you very much, Mr. Schutter. Endorse uh, what has just been said uh, by both uh, uh, Peter Stauder and, and Rudolf Reichsteiner. I think uh, both are right. Um, it is important to make distinctions between different modes of production of biofuels. It's absolutely not the same thing to produce bioethanol from sugarcane or to produce uh, bioethanol uh, from maize, for example, or to produce biodiesel from rapeseed, palm oil, or jatropha. These are very different uh, energetic balances, environmental impacts, and uh, the uh, supply chains are very different. What I would like to emphasize is that because we can't make um, um, uh, one um, single evaluation of all these different types of production. We need to keep in mind uh, the criteria with uh, which Mr. Rechsteiner has rightly pointed out. We need criteria. We need regulation. Um, and the point I'd like to emphasize is that beyond environmental regulations, as you pointed out rightly, beyond the protection of land rights of land users in order to avoid evictions from land of smallhold farmers, beyond uh, the impact even on the prices of food. Um, I think we need to ask the decisive question, which is who benefits? Who benefits? Um, for the production of biofuels, in most cases, small farmers, uh, 
those who are cultivating small plots of land are not able to benefit from the uh, production of these uh, biofuels because these are uh, large scale uh, monocropping plantations and they are in, these are in the hands of very powerful uh, agricultural producers. And so I think one criterion we should keep in mind is who benefits from the increased revenues which come from biofuels. I am not condemning them totally. I just insist that they will not um, contribute to alleviating hunger and poverty if we do not develop modes of agricultural production in this sector which benefit small farmers. And so um, what I think is a main point to keep in mind is uh, the distinction between large-scale agricultural production, particularly for export markets, which I think are a serious problem with all the implications Mr. Uh, Rechsteiner has pointed at, and on the other hand, small-scale production benefiting small farmers in developing countries uh, who have a right to uh, uh, develop themselves in Terralia by producing biofuels. Perhaps I could summarize a little bit. We have talked about the production of biofuels as one of the uh, roots of the um, crisis, the food crisis. Perhaps Mr. Ernie from SwissAid could say something and uh, look at the other causes maybe. Thank you. I think one has to make a distinction between the short-term effects and the long-term reasons that have led to the food crisis or food supply crisis and how these high prices were generated. Probably the production of biofuels was also one of the reasons. In fact, it's a bit unfair if the it was the Europeans who wanted to subsidize this unfairly about three or four years ago. And um, one wanted to make sure that a certain amount of this biofuel would come from the developing countries because this would be contribution to alleviate the, the climate change and have uh, less CO2 emissions. So not much was thought about this in the past, and now the reaction has come from the left, and we're now pretending as if we had nothing to do with it. Can I pick up this question and maybe pass it on to you, Mr. Rechsteiner, this whole discussion on the environmental protection and climate change is really driven by the left and the Greens, so perhaps you should pull up your own socks a little bit and say, well, we've um, made um, wrong proposals. That's a slightly hasty conclusion. On the left, we have always said that there should be a tax exemption of biogas in Switzerland, wherever it is a byproduct from the water treatment stations and in agriculture. There are some very sensible applications of so, such biogas and we've always been against imports. The law states that it has to be given a certificate of cleanliness in environmental protection terms, but in fact the Parliament then has, or the Council, the Federal Council has said that it may not have a less good ecological balance than petrol. So this is absurd. It's been completely overturned, the whole argument. And one has to consider the end of the change. A combustion engine is extremely inefficient. You have a degree of efficiency of 12 to 20 percent and everything else is lost uh, through the exhaust pipe and through transportation. If you take an electric engine that is driven by a wind turbine, then you have an efficiency of 80 percent. So there are renewable energies which require hardly any surface area. A solar cell is probably 20 times more efficient per square meter than maize or sugar. And the future is quite clear. It's electric energy, both in households and in vehicles. We have Minergy, which is a standard. We have active ventilation with the heat recovery. In the United States, this is something that's coming from China, the new technology from Asia. Toyota is saying that in four years' time, there'll be a solar vehicle driven by well, electrically driven uh, 
There's the price, which is a, a hybrid car. So we have the possibility of using renewable energies. I calculated that if the whole Swiss vehicle fleet were to be driven by the by wind energy, we just would need a thousand turbines running in the North Sea. It's possible. It just has to pay for it. But who has imposed the legislation on us? Well, the agribusiness and the oil companies simply because there was an American president who continued saying everywhere we won't change our style of life, we will continue co consuming oil. And, and petrol is something liquid that you can get very easily from a petrol station. So there's a lot of mental inertia that has led to this situation and this line of reasoning. Well, you may clap whenever you want to, says the moderator, and you can also express your uh, dislike of what is being said. Mr. Erni, just to come back very briefly to the short-term reason, the biofuels, the bad crops in certain important agricultural producing countries, very high oil prices, and this has all had as a result that the food prices rose steeply, especially in the cities. Of course, we know only the prices of products that are actually traded, but if we look at where the population is starving most, then it's obviously in the rural regions, which are completely um, cut off from, from the trade. Very often, it didn't really matter whether the price was high or not. But nothing had really changed. If you have a bad crop, they're starving. And if they have a better crop, then they can sell a little bit of the surplus to their neighbors. But that is really the problem. And this brings me to the long-term problems. Let's look at Africa. The average size of a farm is two hectares. That's 80% of all farmers. So how can you produce more than just for yourself on two hectares? And if there's a poor crop, you usually don't get any help from the outside. So what would be important would be to invest in agricultural research, infrastructure, so make sure that these farmers can sell their surplus, when there's a surplus. All these things are completely ignored. If you look at how much is invested in to agricultural research and rural infrastructure, this never gets any priority, the moderator. Is this then an accusation against the multinationals and the agricultural, the big agricultural companies which simply invest there where they can make a profit and there where it would be important, essential, they don't? Well, I don't know whether it has anything to do with these companies. Obviously, the priority is on being economic and profitable, but the governments can set up incentives, give incentives, so that one can also invest in orphan crops like manioc, for example, or, or cooperate with, with public, um, public um, research centers. The orphan crops are manioc and sorghum. Um, these are products that are not very well known on the international markets, but are really important for African subsistence farmers. Manioc is a product that comes out of, comes from Latin America. It's a, it's, it's, it's a plant that can also survive a drought. But what we need is to promote those products which will help the farmers to survive and to produce more than just for their own subsistence. We, there is a research network in which universities, private sector, and uh, international NGOs and scientists participate. And in this network, we look at problems to see what the most cost-effective solution is. Often, you don't need high tech to do so. Some, most times, they can be solved in very cost-effective commercial ways. But here we have people, agrarians, agrarian experts, and, and uh, biologists, and, and other experts who bring, who cooperate together. Research in itself is no use if it is not, if the result is not a product that the farmers then will also accept and can use. Okay, let's move away from biofuels because all sorts of other subjects have been mentioned. There's speculation, for example. Then there's trade policy, research policy, uh, 
then techniques of cultivation, uh, genetic engineering, is that something worthwhile? So let's uh, give the floor back to Mr. Deschutes. Thank you. I think um, we have to realize we are at a very important juncture where we've discovered that agriculture has been neglected for many years and that we needed to reinvest in agriculture. The levels of official development assistance, for example, going to agriculture, which were at about 18, 20 percent in 1980, were at 4, 5 percent in 2007. This is now changing. There's a realization we need to do more for agriculture. But we need to make the right choices. And I think, as very uh, clearly expressed by Philippe Hermy, we need to ensure that the investments we make benefit the right people, are sustainable, from the point of view both of their revenues, the revenues of the poorest, and from the environmental point of view. I would like to um, emphasize that um, there are different understandings of what needs to be done in order to support agriculture. There are basically three models. One is the Green Revolution model, with improved seeds, more fertilizers, uh, pesticides, uh, external inputs, often unaffordable for small farmers, which they should be provided with. That's one model. A green yeah. revolution, uh, ganz Green revolution, could you just explain this very briefly, or shall I? It's a kind of a, a key word. Uh, uh, could you perhaps expound on it a little bit? It's important for this discussion. Yes. So the green revolution model was the one we witnessed in Mexico, in India, other parts of South Asia in the 1960s. And it led to uh, a number of consequences, some positive, increased yields, at least in the beginning, some negative, with sometimes small farmers which were marginalized because they were indebted due to their dependency on these expensive external inputs for their production. But that's one model which remains, and it is one we try to learn from when we launch now the Green Revolution for Africa. We try not to repeat the same mistakes. We, that is, those who are in charge of this. There's a second model, which is betting on technologies, particularly genetic um, engineering. And I fully endorse what was said by, by Philippe Armi on this, on this aspect. It is that research in genetic uh, crops, genetically modified crops, has been mostly serving the interests of the rich farmers of the north. Very little research has been done benefiting small farmers in the south because they are not solvent. They are not an interesting market. And so we need to have public research on uh, genetically modified crops, but we have also to be aware that making the choice for GM crops is very dangerous. I'm not an agronomist. I won't comment on the um, health issues um, and um, um, even on the increased yields which can come from GM crops. But I would like to say that from the social point of view, there are many dangers in relying on GM crops, particularly because it leads to more power in the hands of a very small number of transnational corporations who detain the patents on these seeds, and it creates a dependency for small farmers which may not be sustainable in the long term. So I think it's okay. one solution, uh, but certainly not something which is a substitute for agricultural policies which are sustainable. And that's a third model. Agroecological forms of uh, production, um, participatory plant breeding, um, conservation agriculture. We need not a green revolution. We don't need GM. We need uh, forms of production which respect the ecosystems, which do not focus only on the plants, but also on the environment in which the plant is raised, which respect uh, uh, the environment and which do not contribute to climate change. There is too little uh, research done on agroecological approaches. There is far too little funding of this third approach. And there is um, uh, far too little attention being paid on the impact on climate change of agroindustrial forms of production, which are responsible for the moment for 30% of greenhouse gases emissions in the world. So we need to promote agroecological uh, approaches. Um, many experts agree on the potential for these approaches. For example, um, it's been shown that uh, the yields can increase from 1.1 tons per hectare to 3.7 tons per hectare simply by using 
nitrogen uh, fixing trees, as was done in Malawi for some hundred thousand smallhold farmers. Okay, let's leave you behind, Well, just let me step in there. You you have a very thick book, obviously, with a lot of good information, but we don't want to read out the whole book because it's a discussion that we have to have. But I, one thing is clear from what you stated, um, it, that there are very clear targets. Um, and, and obviously, the only way to get to these objectives is through strong leadership from government. How does that sound in your eyes, uh, Mr. Stadtev, as someone who knows the situation in Mozambique? Well, we're in seven countries in Southern Africa, not just Mozambique. And it's good to come back to the question of the billion people who are short of food. And it's often been said in the past, this, the aphorism about do you give someone a fish or do you teach them to fish? Obviously, you have to teach them to fish. In the, in, in, in the process. But the key in this is to get them to learn to fish. To learn to fish, um, uh, you cannot rely on the corporates in this field, by the way. Because if you look at corporates that are in the food field, um, uh, it is not an easy playing ground. Um, uh, for example, to say to seed companies... They're going to help people with farming practices. It is just not in their domain, by the way. It's not their paradigm. And so I agree with the previous speaker. The solution is not to get more high-tech seeds developed for developing world circumstances and bring them to Africa. In places like Africa, in these countries where people are hungry, by the way, it often comes back to some serious basics. Sometimes the serious basics are simple, as just getting kick-started the transport of product, by the way. Because there's a limited quantum that people can carry on their head, by the way, as we often say in, in, in Africa itself. When you look at the world's behavior, the world doesn't recognize this issue. On the one side, you have the sympathy for these billion people, but the world doesn't really put its full weight sometimes to do something about the issue. Sometimes when people do it, they have amazing results. I know one church organization that went into Lesotho and just did something as basic as taught people farming practices. How do you actually grow maize or corn against the mountain? And how do you preserve the soil? And how do you use the fertilizer that you've got just around you in producing a better yield than, uh, itself? But that's not a natural process that's happening. There are many people that are taking it very seriously. Kofi Annan has been at the World Economic Forum here and has been promoting and pushing the whole question of the Green Revolution in Africa. But in many cases it comes back to basic farming practices, supporting smallholders, just getting them, if they want to buy fertilizer, how do they get fertilizer, organizing the logistics and the training. The potential is there. The arable land in the world is here. There's no use to talk about climate change and no water. There are many African countries that have got water. The dilemma, though, is if you've got water and you can't irrigate from the water, then you're still a dryland farmer. Mm. It's only when you have got a pump and power and learn how to work with a pump that you can irrigate. Yes, I think one very important problem that we have in our discussion is that we're really stuck in the 1970s. That's when the first discussions on the Green Revolution took place. Some people said technology is the problem. Other people said technology is the solution. But that um, was the only level that was discussed at. You didn't really look at developing countries and say what works and what doesn't. Uh, sometimes it was uh, just a question of methodology and not results. So from my point of view, that needs to change. You need to shift towards results. Um, if you look at the question of the technology uh, network, uh, you have tissue mat material laboratories. You're using a number of uh, terms there which um, are not familiar. Uh, we have an educated audience, but, uh, well, with tissue culture uh, laboratories, uh, farmers can clone their own crops. Cassava is uh, something which can be used in that process. The farmers who have knowledge about uh, plant material in the region are going to these plant material cultures. They clone the plant material, and there's a business that's been cultured that's come about there. They have good uh, plant material, which they can then pass on or use for themselves. And it shows that technology can be something 
that it can be used for empowerment. So we mustn't rule out the possibility of using technology. At the time, I talked about this with the farmers, and there was a real sense of self-confidence that they could use this technology, that it wasn't just something for scientists in white coats, but they could actually use it themselves. So I think that uh, these are success stories that you hardly ever hear. And the other thing with the biotechnology network uh, is that only 1% of it is made up out of gene technology, and it's only ever been used to resist uh, viruses or something like that where conventional technology can't be used. Uh, Manioc didn't want to uh, take the other conventional route of um, mixing different varieties because the taste was such that it wasn't acceptable. So gene technology was used. It was spliced into the um, genes of the manioc, which then had the same taste and the same qualities. But because of this one part of gene technology, the, um, this was a success. But the Europeans stopped funding this because of the uh, biotechnology used for genetic engineering. And I think that uh, that clearly shows the, the ties, the conditions that are attached to assistance. Uh, quite often it's our preferences. We're not worried about what's good for what's happening in the field. And we're told that bioproducts from Africa are good, f are good because uh, it helps marginal farmers. But when you look at where it's being produced, these are high capital intensive uh, businesses which are being managed by our supermarkets here in Europe. They're near to uh, airports and it's completely separated from rural poverty. And marginal farmers simply cannot uh, comply with the high standards, the complex regulation and so on. So it's impossible to train them up to that level. But because we know that people are for, are pro-organic goods, or they're pro-goods from Africa, um, they'll buy it. But actually, it has very little relationship to what is happening on the ground in Africa. So let's uh, switch from biofuels, which we talked about at the beginning, to specific problems. Um, which we outlined at the beginning, namely prices and speculation. Now, looking at my statistic, um, in 1974 to 2005, food prices sunk by 75 percent. This is uh, these are statistics from the IMF. Then there was a speculation. Um, now we're in the middle of a financial crisis. The stock markets have crashed. I think someone has already said that this is only a short-term matter. Well, I wouldn't see speculation as a fundamental cause of the crisis that we've had over the last year. I think it's something which is more like a symptom. Um, the issue of speculation needs to be considered bearing in mind that in commodities market goods cannot be stored for more than six months to a year. So the speculators buying wheat, for example, are waiting until the prices are high and then at that point they'll bring it onto the market. That's the story we hear. Well, that might be true. There are futures which provide an orientation point uh, and countries can counter this uh, trend by building their own stores. The same thing is happen happens in the oil industry. It, with many foods, there are national programs, and I'm not very familiar with them all, and I'm not sure what uh, the international coordination is. It would have been very good if the director from FAO was here, from the FAO was here, rather. But I think that the fundamental issues that we're facing is that of climate change and uh, Europe won't be saved. So you're saying that speculation is not a fundamental problem here, just to, just to stick to this question. Well, in one year, it can lead to a higher price, say by 20, 30 percent, but not over the long term. Prices have come down now, and we really need to look at the fundamentals and the longer term trends. I'll just see whether people agree with that. Uh, Mr. Schutte, do you, do you agree that it's not a fundamental issue? Uh, 
Well, I think when um, Mr. Rechsteiner says it's, it's a symptom, he's absolutely right. It's not a cause, it's a signal. Um, the relationship between the futures markets on which you know, people bet uh, that the prices will be uh, that high or that low within six months, the relationship between that market and the spot prices where people actually buy tons of rice or wheat is not a very obvious one. And there's certainly no uh, um, you know, one-to-one direct proportionate relationship between the two. Um, we've had crazy months in the beginning of 2008, where due to much of nervosity on the markets, because the stocks were extremely low because of a few bad harvests, there has been a, a, a panic in the markets, leading countries such as the Philippines, which was mentioned, to buy its ton of rice $1,200 when it had planned $600. The prices went at least uh, doubling um, in, the, in, in a few days in March. Um, but indeed, it is a symptom. It is, it is not a structural factor. Um, the uh, way to combat this, and I think the, the volatility is much more problem than high prices, the way to combat this is either by returning to commodity stabilization agreements we've known in the 1970s, or to allow countries to build food reserves which have a regulating function. I have to say that this solution, food reserves, is one which many countries had in place until the mid-1980s, but they were dismantled, these food reserves, upon the request of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, and still today, in 2008, for example, um, in Mali, they produced 100,000 um, tons of rice in, in surplus, and they wanted to stop this rice because who knows, maybe in 2009 they would not have enough to feed their population. And the World Bank opposed this. They were basically obliged to sell the rice on the international markets, and this will create a dependency for countries such as Mali, who then are highly affected by high prices if the prices are high on the international markets. So we need mechanisms which regulate the markets. We cannot continue with markets which are so volatile. This is good neither for consumers nor for producers. Haben Sie dann nicht das Problem? But don't you then have the other, the opposite problem that will arise if you try and control or direct the market and then have market distortions? This would also lead to negative situations. So crisis that the world is in at the moment, one of the few benefits of the financial crisis is that not, many, not much money will be chasing speculative positions in food production, by the way, in the scene. So, and and I, I really think the whole question of biofuels and the, the speculators is a disguise of the fundamental issue. The fundamental issue of people that are malnutrition is not an import-export issue, by the way. So when you start thinking import-export, you're already starting to miss the medium-term solution for people um, that are undernourished. Um, ultimately, to deal with undernourished people, You've got to create food production and food markets in their countries by and large, by the way. And that's very little related to the issue. Actually, with food prices, one of the ironies has been that for many years, through distortions of trade regimes and through subsidization, there were many food products that actually were too cheap. They were too cheap for new emerging agricultural countries to produce at that price, largely based on subsidies in those countries that are already well established in agriculture. So you have this dichotomy of highly productive agricultural countries also subsidizing it and then creating prices that are so low that newly emerging countries in agriculture that want to feed their own population didn't have a place in the sun. When these prices shot up, it didn't help anybody, by the way, and the price was too quick for helping people. It's come down back again. Uh, so there is a pricing issue. But I would say the more medium-term, long-term fundamental pricing issue is not this first short-term spike, but is the whole question of world subsidies, world trade regimes, and how do you create the space in the sun for developing countries that want to develop their own agriculture, feed their own people, by the way, uh, to be able to have an agricultural sector. And I think that's much more the dom dominant issue in the world than the speculative biofuel spike issue. Herr Richsteiner, ich entschuldige. Herr Rechsteiner, I'd like to apologize for having cut you off when you wanted to lead on to the climate change, not without a 
uh, other idea in mind. I think you're very much invested and involved in wind energy and wind turbines. Yes, I have set up an energy cooperative and we operate wind turbines and solar energy plants. And I think that if I want to propound renewable energies, then I have to know what I'm talking about. And I have been involved for more than 20 years. And I think it's a very good thing indeed. I'd like to come back once more to this question of whether it's wrong to control and direct the markets. We've had 20 years of blocker deregulation and the condemnation of all politicians that they always do everything wrong. Every time I'm part of a panel, I'm told that the politics, the politicians are doing everything wrong. So markets have been deregulated all over the place. And now suddenly the state has to buy up the banks and that there are record high prices in the energy sector. And let me just say also that the International Agen Energy Agency has consistently provided us with the wrong recipes, saying, for example, that in 2030, oil will still only cost maximum $29 a barrel, and we were at nearly $150 last year. Now, what's happening is that politics are being rehabilitated, but you are right to some extent that politicians have exaggerated regulation or deregulation. For foodstuffs, there is a need for storage and warehouses. What SwissAid has been doing for a long time is what Switzerland did in the last and second last century. That is to say, create cooperatives, give microcredits, uh, set up saving systems, uh, give education on agricultural activity without being obliged to buy fertilizers from the north, but using local fertilizers from local plants. And Swiss aid has been very successful. We feel that development starts at the root and not in conference halls. One of the most terrible misdevelopments of Kyoto, and I think it's important to mention this in connection with the food crisis, is that we were told, we the parliamentarians were told, that if you import green fuel, then you're going to reduce CO2 emission. Now, Brazil has no obligations to reduce CO2. All the fertilizers, all the pesticides, all the transportation, all these inputs that go into agriculture were simply not counted in Switzerland. So the, the objective was to reduce CO2 emission, but the overall damage was much greater. A lot of soya plantations have much higher CO2 emissions than a normal a litre of normal petrol, ordinary petrol. So it's a question of communication as well, which was mismanaged in connection with Kyoto. Also, what uh, the United States did, to the United States promoting the, the trading in certificates. I think we have to now focus on the good examples. They come, for example, from Germany with uh, alleviations and allocations given to the use of renewable energy in the national grid. And this is contributing much more than anything that can be said or agreed at a conference under the title of uh, biofuel and uh, the CO2 emission certificates and trading. But let's come back to fundamentals. You said that it's not the speculation, but climate change is a main cause. In China, for example, which is a country that can, has self-sufficiency, there was a lot of pollution and a lowering of the underground water tables. What we need is moving away from gas, oil, and coal and to move to renewable energies. I'm going to say something very brave here. We will 
have achieved this in 20 years. The growth of solar and wind energy is so incredible, and the Chinese are investing so much in these types of energy. They will manage. They are able to make this switch very quickly. The Chinese simply have banned engines like Vespers or other types of vehicles that are heavy energy consumers. In Shanghai, you already have three million electric-driven Vespers and motorbikes, and in, in a few years' time, everything will be wind energy driven. In Switzerland, we are simply very backward and we are an enclave of, of very protected people. We have simply not participated in this development. The CO2 emission is simply ignored by the Federal Council. We have the heaviest lorries in Europe. We have the cheapest heating fuel and uh, other uh, petrol. Switzerland has simply not participated in any of the developments that took place in Europe. Sie spüren, es fehlt. Well, uh, there's no counterpart to Mr. Reschsteiner on the more right side of the political spectrum, Mr. Erni. What role can biotechnology then play in order to reduce our rate of pollution and emission. We have already been able to abuse biofuel through the use of cellulosis and the biotechnology applied to cellulosis, and there are other interesting developments. Photo respiration of plants can be reduced and uh, have a, a reduced photosynthesis and less growth, and then biomass could be tripled without adding any water or fertilizer. Some people are also saying that we are going from a petrochemical industry to a more bio, biological industry or biotechnical industry. And, and uh, is it now possible to replace certain chemicals or, or chemical products, or do you not agree with this? I don't want to exclude biofuels entirely in, in normal transport and traffic. We have refused or are against gene, genetic technology because in the South, farmers cannot afford it. They can develop it themselves. There is very advanced agriculture, for example, in horticulture with, where local fertilizers are used. If we could invert the relationship of dependency, then I'd be very happy to see India develop its own biotechnology that would free the farmers from this dependence on the north. Mr. Deschutes would like to come in on this. Could we just conclude this very interesting discussion, Mr. Erni, very quickly? Take the example of Cuba. Here, agricultural biotechnology has been very heavily invested in in the last 20 years, but mainly for self-sufficiency and self-supply purposes. And Marxists uh, have a very weird reaction to this, and I'm surprised by this. They are against genetic technology, but on the other hand, Cuba is always given as a very good example, even though there are a lot of genetic technology is being used. Many countries try to emulate what is done elsewhere. Maybe the industry is so demonized that nothing is going to be done free of charge. If you look at Monsanto, which has a technology for resistance to, to drought, and they were going to offer this free of charge if a partner was going to uh, 
use it in order to improve the, the resistance of these plants, but no public institution, no public body was willing to take this on and ruin its own reputation. That is, say, a partnership with Monsanto would have been bad for their reputation, their image. If you look at agriculture and health, well, in health, you have uh, good um, possibilities of PPPs or partnership, but in agriculture, except for the Golden Rice um, Initiative or project, there are hardly any such PPPs, and this is also a disadvantage. Mr. Schutten? Vielleicht noch gleich eine Organisation. Just as organizational comment and we will then move on to questions from the audience. Maybe we will uh, conclude with you, Mr. De Schutten, and then we'll give the floor to the public. Word, but I, I'm happy to react to the recent uh, exchange. I think we have to realize that agriculture is both a victim and one of the primary causes of climate change. It's a victim. Uh, there are predictions from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that in certain regions of Africa, which are based on rain-fed agriculture, the production will drop by 50% in 2020. Um, at the horizon of 2080, overall in the world, the production will diminish by 8% in comparison to the levels of 2000 as a result of drought, weather-related events, as a result of climate change. So agriculture is a victim of climate change is the single most important threat to future food security. And agriculture contributes to climate change by many methods of production, which are using chemical um, uh, fertilizers and which are uh, emitting large amounts of greenhouse gases emissions. There are alternatives to these agro-industrial modes of production. And there are examples which uh, are multiplying of agroforestry, uh, agroecological approaches. For example, in Tanzania, we had two provinces in the west of Tanzania which were called the desert of Tanzania until the 1980s. And in the 1980s, there was an agroforestry program which is combining um, the planting of trees with uh, food crops in order to uh, base yourself on the complementarity between the two. And this uh, led 350,000 hectares of land to be rehabilitated with um, the average household having its incomes increased by $500 uh, per year. So, and this was without you know, expensive chemical uh, uh, inputs or improved seeds. It was simply good agroecological practices which were promoted. And this does not lead to the kind of dependency which we are led to when we rely on biotechnologies or genetically modified uh, crops. 97% um, of the patents in biotechnologies are detained by OECD-based multinational companies. So this is a very concentrated market in the hands of very few actors, and the risks of dependency are very real for the South and for small farmers in particular. Um, I think this is what I wanted to say, that we, need to do, we needed to explore alternatives to the usual technology-driven recipes, which usually are promoted as the solution to the food problem. Thank you very much. Now we are waiting with much expectation for your questions. Thank you. First question here. Could you wait for the microphone, please? Wait for the microphone. For independent thinkers around the world, and a question for Mr. Ernia. Uh, Samuel Kangeri of Kenya, he leads our working group Mendenyo, which means uh, men without food, which means uh, we don't have to eat today, we can invest for a better tomorrow. And uh, what we found working with him is that uh, very small projects, like for $100, can really help us uh, uh, meet each other halfway uh, from the West and from Africa and be sensitive, like they know very well uh, what are the kinds of investigations or, or small projects or endeavors would make the most uh, value in their in their region. So what I'd like to do is I invite anybody here else, uh, to sign up for our group, but uh, we're able to mobilize hundreds and thousands of people uh, for, for global teams, and we just can't find who to work for. We have this huge assets of relationship. Uh, we got some sponsorship to build a Wikipedia of the world's food supply chain to collect stories, personal stories from farmers like Samuel. It was extremely effective and cost-effective and many good projects on the side.
but we just don't fit in the picture. All the projects seem to focus on the poorest of the poor, the richest of the rich, and they try to exclude all these people in the middle who are the solution, and they try to eliminate any transparency or inclusion uh, you know, along the middle or any profit along the middle. So uh, all right. how, what could we do? I think Philippe Ernie can uh, give you an answer. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like our organization in Zambia. We are focusing on exactly the same questions. We have Ah, yeah. Also, we have yes, yeah, this organ also, you have any organization. Well, I founded an organization together with, um, it's called the African Technology Development Forum from Zambia. And the, the idea is to invest in local undertakings uh, because they form the, the middle step, if you like. If you're working with the multinationals, they're interested in um, poor people making profits in their own interests. They want to see self-sustaining businesses and uh, Microcredits is something which is easy to deal with there in the neighborhood, but, in, but investing in a new product which is locally bought requires investment. Venture, venture capital only invests if someone can bring a million to the table. We have an entrepreneurship award which we've founded, and a hundred people came along with a business plan, local people, good ideas. We chose ten for an interview, and then at the end, uh, two got an award. Uh, from $40,000, um, one working with sunflower oil. Uh, it's very difficult than running a business in the formal sector because then you need uh, specific standards, uh, all the complexity of the formal sector, uh, which is also very expensive for poor people. But we believe that it's only possible for a middle class to emerge if you invest in people and ideas and allow them to grow and employ people. And that's endogenous growth. And that's the only way in which a democracy could be stable. Because a democracy without a middle class is always going to collapse. Is there a possibility that you could um, meet together after the... Um, open forum discussion and you can pass on your details. Yes, uh, person at the front. A question to Mr. Stur or Mr. Erni. Is it true that once a patent has expired, uh, the major cons the major enterprises give up uh, their rights on agricultural products and also the production of it. So the underdeveloped countries cannot then access this information which should be in the public domain in order to uh, grow their own seeds. Well, perhaps I could answer that first. Well, the situation with patents is that the information have to, has to be made public uh, to get um, the patent, but then it is subject to an authorization or license fees. And then after the patent has expired, every, anybody is free to use the technology and to develop a new product out of it. So patents are a difficult area, but if you look at the concentration in the industry at the moment, um, it, things have a lot more to do with the high level of regulation, which makes it very difficult for a small enterprise to make it to the market. Quite often a precondition is for them to have their own product, which they have developed and be able to uh, market. So I think it's difficult to, to associate patents simply with the uh, big industry, because for small companies, it's, um, it's important. There are things called petty patents relating to um, low-tech innovations for five, and they're valid for four, five years. That's come a long way in India, and one activist has find, found out that the small farmers were very innovative, but it was innovative innovation born of necessity, and they didn't realize that that innovation could be useful for other farmers as well. So they created a knowledge bank uh, and 
gave farmers, granted farmers, petty patents, uh, which enabled the spread of knowledge and also revenues for the farmers. And quite often the argument is a bit one-sided, the measures are not very creative, um, because we have tools and sometimes they're abused and sometimes, like patents, they can be uh, used badly or used well. So the question is how can we avoid misuse and promote good use? Uh, in agricultural technology, there's an open source movement which is uh, flourishing. Many big companies are participating in that. So what you're saying is that there's your, the fear of the questioner isn't um, really justified. Yes, well, what, what happens if, if, the, if the knowledge is there? It doesn't necessarily mean it can be used because you need tacit knowledge. And if the capital is there but the infrastructure isn't there or the knowledge isn't there, then patents simply aren't relevant for the smallest farmers because they need a, an education to be able to understand the patents and how to implement it. Uh, so you really need the investment in education so people know how to use this knowledge. Um, I'll uh, be taken, taking other questions. Maybe you can meet after the, um, the discussion. He doesn't agree 100 percent. We have a question over there. Uh, my, my name is John Phillips and I'm a teacher of economics at the International School of Geneva. Um, I think perhaps the root of some of the problems lies 20 years ago. I think Mr. De Schutter alluded to this when he talked about the uh, surpluses that countries could accrue. Uh, we had uh, before that time, before the 80s, a time when many countries in Africa, such as Sudan, were even net exporters of food. And we had the kind of breadbasket uh, effect where big areas like the uh, Jazeera could produce masses of uh, cereals, for example, for export. And the uh, debt crisis of the, of the uh, 1980s created a situation whereby there was a, a turn towards cash crops. And cash crops such as cotton in Sudan or tobacco in Zimbabwe. You can't eat cotton, you can't eat uh, tobacco, so these had to be sold on the open market and the idea was that the countries would then buy in the surpluses that were being produced elsewhere in the world, like uh, in the United States, Canada, or wherever. Can I but, ask you to, but, to but, ask yes. the question, please? So the question is really that since those times, countries have been forced into a position to produce not food crops, because food crops imported only arrive at the main ports of import and are not sent out to the billion or so that are very hungry. They tend to stop relatively short. Uh, they, they, they don't penetrate into the country. And as long as the World Bank is supporting such policies, uh, we will not get the, the required uh, change uh, that we need. Mm -hmm. Therefore, do the, any of the panel, I'd perhaps address this to, to Mr. Stauder, thanks to his experience in Africa, um, can this uh, situation change without reform of the World Bank itself and its structural adjustment policies and all that sort of thing? Thank so it's much. connected to the reform of the World Bank and the IMF. Thank you. Yes, I think, first of all, there is progress being made in some of these forums, by the way. And I wanted to use this opportunity, for example, to compliment the European Union on its everything but arms deal for the least developed countries in the world that's created a certain platform forward. At the same time, I see consistently when you go to forums like the World Economic Forum, when you listen to people like the World Bank, that the insight of how different is an African country compared to a country in the development world is not really sometimes there. Um, uh, and we have been pushing as Africa and as these countries to have a better representation on some of these world forums. But there is a balance. Um, uh, one of the biggest shifts, by the way, that's taken place in the World Food Program um, uh, is that it's shifted from buying its food, like corn or maize in the United States, and is now buying 80% of its food from those developing countries. So the awareness that you need to move away from an import-export type of food program um, uh, that you don't got to give Lagos you know, wheat and coke 
I think you're nourishing the um, population um, uh, as an example. That is starting to come through in many of these forums. So many people are advocating all the time in aid, for example. Sometimes it's better, by the way, not to give food aid, but actually to give money for people to buy some food in the local um, area. And, and that realization, that whole loop has not been closed yet. So I want to endorse what the question has been asked. You need to reform some of these world bodies. Thank you very much. Next uh, frage aus dem auditorium, bitte. Yes, a uh, question at the middle there. A bit further back. Yes, Alec Gunnick. I work um, on development cooperation. We've been working in India and Africa uh, with solar energy and family uh, planning. I have a question to Mr. Rechsteiner and Mr. De Schutter. Mr. Ernie said that there is some, sometimes uh, there are very unilateral discussions, one-sided, perhaps uh, the same here today. Perhaps um, it's because we've eaten so much that we've come here and we've very difficult to remember what the actual conditions are. Um, one thing is the demographic uh, situation moving towards 9 billion people. Um, what can we do in the face of that? And I'm also amazed that almost all NGOs in Switzerland have a major problem with family planning, which uh, has been a human right for a long time. I've worked together with the Swiss uh, assistant agency we've had and others uh, for 10 years, and nobody wants to integrate this human right into their own projects. I've tried to understand why that is. I don't have any solution. Um, but I could talk perhaps with Mr. Rischteiner about that. Well, let's ask him now um, whether we're talking about charities or Swiss aid. Are you not interested in family planning? Well, I wouldn't say we're not interested. I can't confirm what the questioner has said. One very important element of our work at Swiss aid is women's development. So the programs are often women targeted, uh, women who found banks. Uh, credit organizations based on self-organization. I don't think you simply you can simply open an office and handing out condoms or giving family planning advice. I think what it begins with is the educational chances of women. I think that we've seen a real setback in or a real drop in birth rates in those countries where women have been included in the economic process, in education, and uh, can improve their self-confidence. I'm not against family planning. It's very important. I think the difference between China and India is that China has uh, implemented a family planning program, uh, very authoritarian, admittedly, uh, but it's bearing fruit. In India, there's a very unstable situation because uh, family planning hasn't actually been applied. Any other questions? Can I, uh, can I see whether there are anybody else wishing to ask a question? You'd, uh, perhaps more than I expected. Um, so let's continue with a few more questions. Over there in the same corner. Can I draw your attention to the national agricultural policy? in two countries, uh, Afghanistan and Colombia. In southern Afghanistan, we see efforts um, to increase corruption uh, because there are significant opium crops. They've been increasing. How can we stop that? I, there's an increasing amount of uh, drug addiction in Switzerland. Uh, obviously, that's related. We don't need that in Europe or America. Drug addiction to uh, morphine or heroin uh, undermines a social. So why, why is it uh, opium that's being uh, harvested. 
and not food? Well, one reason is the fact that there is prohibition. It's a very profitable crop um, for an exclusive guild of gangsters who um, grow these crops. The antidote is the Swiss model, which um, prescribes drugs to users to help them come off. And I think that the solution lies in the consumer countries, and it's only the high profit margins which lead to uh, the growth of these crops. Yes, next question uh, in the black jumper. Yeah. My name is Ursula Sessa. In the 1980s, I was in America traveling, visiting friends, and I, was, I spent some time on a farm, and I was allowed to uh, work on an enormous field, uh, which was full of a crop of uh, maize, and then the um, crop was harvested, uh, but it had ultimately to be destroyed because there was a surplus on the market and the price needed to be kept high. So I saw that um, and it made me reflect upon the fact that hundreds of thousands of people are suffering from hunger and crops are being destroyed. Mr. Ernie, would you like to answer that? Well, yes, uh, it's a question about uh, surplus and it's related to subsidies as well. And it's perhaps one of the most significant problems. Uh, it's something which you don't only see on the ground on farms, but uh, also it applies to all the food that we buy and throw away, on what supermarkets buy and throw away as well. So I think that if you produce beyond what is necessary, one of the major problems is um, distribution. Now, it's partly true that it's a distribution problem and not a production problem. What you, but what is to be done with these crops? Should they be given as a gift to Africa? Um, well, that would be difficult because it's, it's very difficult for their markets to absorb uh, gifts, free food, whether it's uh, food, whether it's old T-shirts and jumpers, whether it's... Uh, any kind of surpluses, that distorts the local markets and creates problems. So the solution for such problems is not simply just to give away uh, the crops where agriculture, where agriculture markets exist because it threatens livelihoods. Many years people saw the solution was to send a surplus food to that part of the world that is undernourished. But what you do is you kill all the farmers in that area, by the way. The attention should be much more to get those farmers to become productive um, uh, rather than just sending your surplus product to those regions. Because if you do it, you are permanently having to supply food to that part of the world for many years to come. And it's not the solution in the long term. Obviously, in the short term, there's a humanity issue often. And that's when the real crisis comes. But it is not a food product that you can't buy somewhere in areas of the world where people are developing agriculture right at the moment. We have two or three more questions, plus an addition from Mr. Deschutes. To react to this uh, question and to relate this to what I think is indeed identified as the main problem we've seen since 20 years. Um, the addiction of many developing countries to cheap food from the international markets. They were helped, we thought, by the surpluses being dumped on their local markets, and we ruined agriculture in many of these countries. There's no alternative in the long term for them to build robust agricultural systems in order to feed their populations. Um, and it's an illusion to think that they will be able to produce export crops, tea, coffee, tobacco, cotton, and gain sufficient revenues to buy their food. The prices are simply too volatile. And that's dangerous. That creates a dependency which is extremely dangerous, and it kills farming. Now, what this shows is we need supply management schemes because if we want to avoid the absurd situation where we produce surpluses, which then we either destroy or dump on developing countries, we need to control better 
how food is produced. And, and there are such supply management schemes, such as, for example, in Canada, for egg, milk, um, uh, chicken, and, and turkey. There are quotas each producer respects so that we know exactly how much they will be paid for their produce, how much they will gain. Uh, the consumer is protected from volatile prices, and there are no surpluses which are dumped on developing countries. That's the future. We need a common agricultural policy for the different regions of the world, which is self-sustaining and which would avoid the problems we've seen with uh, the dependency on international trade to feed populations. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, time for two or three questions, so I'll choose the highest hands. Yes, here in the fourth row, the lady. I think one problem which hasn't really been addressed yet is uh, the power of the food companies. In Africa, there's not only the problem of uh, lack of availability, um, there's also the problem of uh, diabetes because of the consumption of Coca-Cola, that kind of thing, and they're not aware of the consequences of um, an unbalanced diet. So is there another issue here, namely that the food multinationals are driven by profit, they have to make their profit, and that this is simply not being controlled, that their power is untrammeled. So my question to you, Mr. Stauber, is that you, are, you have to make profits to keep your position, obviously, otherwise uh, you wouldn't be where you are now in two years' time. But how do you regulate the profit drive in order not to um, damage people and the environment? Is, are these the kind of problems that you discuss, Mr. Stauder? Uh, with regard to... Um, poor diet, etc. You, you have to link nutrition and health together. Um, uh, you, you cannot separate nutrition and health. And if you look at Africa particularly, um, uh, there's a big health issue and a nutritional issue. The, the, the knowledge base on nutrition and health that is typically in an African country compared to an European country is like day and night. I mean, it's very hard if you haven't lived there to understand the, the gap. Clearly on the health side, there are some major, major health issues. Um, uh, recently, cholera out of Zimbabwe got a lot of the news, but the reality is in the countries around it, for example, in malaria, many, many people continue to die in the world of malaria I I itself. The food producers that sent a um, uh, product um, into Africa are relatively limited, by the way, and particularly in the poorer countries. Um, uh, there is obviously countries, companies like Coca-Cola, etc., that are sending a lot of product to it. The responsibility um, uh, of NGOs, of private organizations, and on African governments to educate these people more on nutrition and health is an enormous gap. Um, uh, the expenditure on health per capita in many of these southern African countries is quite high. I'm quite proud that South Africa's spending on health per GDP is higher than most European countries, as an example. Um, so there is a link, there is an issue, but I wouldn't say the dominant issue is what you eat um, in terms of health. There are other bigger health risks at the moment that really are crying out to be resolved in some of these countries. Good, Herr Stade, Sie hat Sie direkt angesprochen. Now, you were asked that question, I'm sure, because you are also um, involved in a company which is profit-oriented, but um, who is supervising your company and who is responsible for the conduct of this company? Country in, in sub-Saharan Africa and, and you get a country for example like South Africa that is heavily controlled and, uh, and, and where companies are heavily controlled and is much more similar to Europe. If you go to a place like Angola, um, uh, you've got a dominant feature of all companies going in there and very relatively few other organizations. So each one of these countries have got their own dynamics um, uh, itself. Um, uh, I would say that would be um, uh, probably the way to answer the question. Thank you very much. Let's have the last question then at the back. The lady in the white T-shirt. Sinrasi from Bern. Panel, if they have ever heard of aeroponics, first of all. <laughs> 
And secondly, Was ist das? Mix is a form of producing food on a bare wall in sort of boxes. And in many countries there are walls which are no longer green. And they make these green things added climate to it and they can harvest the food. This okay. is available in a sort of open source scheme. You can look at it on the internet under aeroponics. And like in many desert countries, they're trying to make them green again. I think this is the way forward. Is, uh, well, I think um, there's a certain amount of uh, perplexity up here on the panel, even Mr. Ernie from the ETA. I don't know how big this market is or who is uh, involved in this and how it can be combined with other things. Uh, it sounds certainly very promising. And, of course, if you don't need um, a big input cost or whatever, if things just grow and you can just go and harvest it, sounds like a good approach also. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I come now to the end of our discussions. I turn to each of our panelists and ask for a very brief conclusion um, to uh, summarize and uh, draw a conclusion from our discussions, giving you each uh, 30 seconds to a lesson, but perhaps begin with Mr. Recksteiner. Well, I would say that the food crisis can be resolved if, peop if poor people get purchasing power, if um, they can organize their own provision uh, with the necessary education to do that for men and women, and also a selective exchange of ideas between North and South. I don't want to exclude that, but I do believe that development needs to uh, come from developing countries themselves. It certainly can't take place on the basis of food aid. Uh, it needs to be the result of ecologically oriented agricultural policy to meet the country's own needs. Once that succeeds, uh, on top of that, the supplements can be achieved through cash crops. But that's not the first step. Uh, the first step is taking care of it, one's own needs. Otherwise, um, cash crops make a country incredibly vulnerable to price fluctuations. I think one shouldn't be surprised um, uh, when you hear 960 million people are undernourished, when you also recognize that more than 2 billion people of the world are living than, on less than a dollar a day, by the way. And if you really know what it means to live on less than a dollar a day, you know you've got a problem. In many of these countries, there are no functional food markets. At the same time, in many of these countries, they are crying out for help in terms of est establishing the agricultural system. And, uh, and I really want to urge those people who live in the more privileged countries to really think how they can help these countries to get out of their dilemma. Thank you very much. Uh, now I now give the floor. Oh, well, I'll give the floor to the UN Special Representative at the end of the discussion. Yes, well, my discussion, would, my recommendation would be that, uh, that we be more humble in our approach to agriculture through developmental assistance. If you look at best practices, you quite often realize that developing, the, the best ideas come from developing countries and not from us. Um, but we tend to have this belief that we can save the world, uh, failing to recognize the complexity of the situation on the ground. Often the results are bad. If you take the best practices in terms of, of the use of technology, um, then you don't get, end up with this polarization of either high technology is good or traditional methods are good. You see that there's always a mix and there is a, so many different possibilities, so many different approaches that can be tried. Uh, but once these are successful, then there's very little sharing of that success, the knowledge of that success. And so it's necessary to take a, a good approach like that. First of all, on the reactions of the international community to the global food crisis, um, I think um, the focus has been on providing help, providing support to agriculture. And this is a very important dimension of the reaction. Um, it's comforting that much is done today to help agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa in particular. But there are at least three other 
issues which I believe are neglected, underestimated, and hugely important. One is reforming trade in order to ensure that trade serves development, and for the moment it does not. A second is examining the practices of the agribusiness sector and ensure that they are not reaping the benefits of more produ production, but that these benefits reach small farmers. And a third issue is regulation of markets, stabilizing measures which uh, limit the volatility of prices on international markets. And we will not have a sustainable food system simply by more inputs being available to farmers. We also need to think at these more structural issues. Secondly, my job is, as Special Rapporteur on Right to Food, to promote the right to food as a human right. Now, you may think this is naive, as if we were legislating against hunger, but in fact it's hugely important to keep in mind this um, objective we are pursuing. It's not enough to produce more. We also need to think of whom is benefiting from the production and to make sure that the most vulnerable will be helped by whichever reforms we undertake. And the right to food is useful because it obliges us to draw our attention to those most vulnerable. It's also useful because it obliges us to think of accountability mechanisms so that countries remember their promises, their undertakings, so that governments are held accountable to their populations and so that we move in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dushuta. I think um, that's brought us full circle from my opening uh, comments about uh, the right to food. So um, I'd like to thank the special rapporteur. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Ernie once again. Um, I'd say his name because he's not in the uh, program. He works at the World Trade Institute and uh, works for the NGO African Technology Development Forum. Peter Stauder, CEO of Tonga Dulit in South Africa. And Rudolf Rechsteiner, uh, SP National Councillor from Basel. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting discussion. Thank you for your attention.